Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Martha Lucy. I'm Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education here at the Barnes, and I am delighted um, that you are all here for this program. This is the second in our four-part conversation series called The Barnes Then and Now, which we've organized as part of our 100th anniversary celebration. This series is an opportunity for us to celebrate our founder, Dr. Albert C. Barnes, and to highlight some of the things that made the Barnes Foundation so distinct during his lifetime. And I am referring to the unconventional installation of the collection, the progressive education program, and the fierce commitment to social justice. But this series is not just about sifting through our past. It's also an occasion to reflect on the present, to examine our current work in these areas that continue to be so important to the Barnes's identity. The focus for tonight's conversation is our relationship with Lincoln University, the nation's first degree-granting historically black university. The relationship between the Barnes and Lincoln began in 1946, and you'll hear much more about this in a minute. Um, I will skip ahead to 1950, when Albert Barnes decided, a year before his death, that he would grant Lincoln the power to nominate four of the Foundation's trustees. In 2003, the relationship between these two institutions resurfaced in the news. The Barnes Foundation's board had expanded from five to 15 members, which meant that Lincoln would no longer nominate the majority of the trustees. There were lots of feelings about this decision that sometimes became entangled with opinions about the impending move of the collection. But we are not here uh, tonight to revisit that controversy. We are here to learn a little bit more about the origins of the partnership in the 1940s because it's a fascinating story and to talk about its future. And this future is exciting and full of potential. And I think the fact that we have the leaders of these two institutions here tonight sitting with us and willing to talk publicly about this relationship is a testament to that. Brenda Allen, sitting in the middle, is president, Dr. Brenda Allen is president of Lincoln University. She previously served as chair of the African American Studies Department at Smith College, associate provost uh, and director of institutional diversity at Brown, and provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs at Winston-Salem State University. She earned her bachelor's in psychology from Lincoln and her doctorate degree from Howard University. Tom Collins is Neubauer Family Executive Director and President of the Barnes Foundation. He is a Philadelphia native with more than 20 years of experience at some of America's top art institutions, including the Perez Art Museum in Miami, the Neuberger Museum in Purchase, New York, the Contemporary in Baltimore, the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle, and, the, and MoMA in New York. And um, Tom has just brought in an incredible vision um, to this place, and I feel very privileged to work with and for him. The conversation tonight will be moderated by Roxanne Patel Shepalavi. Uh, Roxanne Patel Shepalavi is executive editor and co executive director of the Philadelphia Citizen, which is a nonprofit media organization whose mission is to actively reignite citizenship in Philadelphia and to provide excellent journalism that emphasizes solutions to problems. So if you haven't, if you're not familiar with The Citizen, you haven't checked it out, um, just Google it and go to their website because they are very active and it's, um, it's I think it's a really important uh, organization and publication. Uh, I am so grateful to the three of you for being here tonight, um, and thank you to everybody for being here too, and welcome to uh, everybody who's tuning in online. So I'll let you get started. Thank you. 
Is this working? Is this on? Yes? Great. Hi. Uh, thanks, Martha. Um, I'm, really, um, I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you to all of you for being here as well. Um, Martha gave a little bit of background, and um, I wanted to actually start with um, a quote from uh, Dr. Allen here, uh, from when we spoke earlier, just to sort of set the framing for what we're going to talk about. Um, she said, how do we salvage the intent of Albert Barnes and Horace Mann Bond, the president of Lincoln at the time, given everything that's happened, and have a relationship that manifests in the 21st century? So this is, this is what, um, and, and I got a little sneak preview, and it's very, it's very cool. Um, so I wanted to start first with, let's go back a little bit. Um, actually, let's go back a lot. Let's go back, you know, 1946, I think it was. Um, I'd love to know a little bit about... Um, a little bit more about Dr. Barnes, a little bit more about Dr. Man Bond, um, and so if each of you could sort of, you know, take your guy, um, and then um, and then I'd love to know a little bit about the how the relationship started. Um, so, uh, Brenda, why don't you start? All right. Well, thank you, and um, it's great to be here with Tom. And it's um, I just want to say it's been somewhat of a, an emotional roller coaster, um, just going through preparing. And what I did wrong was I started with the controversy of the more recent years as opposed to um, the real story. And I got back to the real story and uh, I'm just fascinated by two men who were um, just incredible um, and very maverick in their thinking for their time. So Dr. Horace Mann Bond, um, one thing I think um, is impressive for African Americans is that in, born in 1904, he was already a second generation educated. So both of his parents were educated at integrated colleges in Ohio, um, which um, sort of set him off on a path that was so very different than the path set off for, um, for Dr. Barnes. And I, I find that just interesting in a, in a paradoxical way. Um, he graduated at 19 years old from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. He then went on various teaching jobs, but finished his master's and his PhD at the University of Chicago. And his intellectual work um, over the course of his life was really around bettering educational experiences for African Americans. And he's often described as someone who worked um, really um, openly to try to push for desegregation, but at the same time worked very quietly to try to make sure that the education that African Americans did have access to was the best education that we can possibly have. I became really acquainted with Dr. Bond, President Bond, as a graduate student. So one of my research um, interests had to do with intelligence and in reading some of the really very early work that black psychologists and, and black sociologists were doing in the 1930s, I came across many of the papers where he wrote um, and, and offered all kind of data to refute the idea that black people were in, inferiorly, inferior, inherently inferior to whites. Um, a lot of the data that was used in a big study called the Alpha Beta Study on Army Recruits looked at the intelligence scores of blacks versus the intelligence scores of whites and concluded that blacks were, um, were um, intellectually inferior. And Bond and some other early scholars were able to take that data, pull it apart, found trends such as blacks who lived in the north scored higher than whites who lived in the south. Um, they found that education and background was much more related to how people um, scored on those tests rather than, rather than race. And so it really began a different sort of inquiry into the whole debate on IQ and intelligence. And um, so he was really a leader there. So to really recognize then that I now um, sit in a seat where he once um, sat um, is just really very interesting to me. And to find out this week that I sleep in a house where, where Dr. Barnes was at one night is a little spooky to me. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I have inherited a great legacy and I want to do my best to make sure that we steward it to the highest degree. It's a great story. Uh, Dr. Barnes' story is a great story too, and I'm gonna to try to hit just a few of the highlights that I think are relevant to the conversation we're about to have. Uh, Dr. Barnes was born in 1872 into poverty. He was raised in a couple of, of really under-resourced, underserved neighborhoods in the city. 
Uh, important to his story is that he spent a great deal of time with his mother as a child, and uh, he and Dr. Bond actually shared the fact that they were both raised as Methodists. And while this seems like it shouldn't be relevant to the story, it's very relevant in the sense that Barnes' uh, mother frequently took him with her when she would attend uh, what were integrated, uh, you know, camp tent revivals and camp meetings. Uh, Methodism in the period right after the Civil War was the fastest growing denomination in the United States. And it was in part the fastest growing denomination because it was really the first Protestant denomination that argued for earned salvation as opposed to predestined salvation. So it was very popular with people who were not privileged. It was very popular with African American people. It was very popular with poor people. Uh, and, and so Dr. Barnes was raised in that tradition and often in his life spoke about the very significant early childhood memories of being at these, these uh, revival meetings and hearing African American people at the meetings performing music, singing, and how this, the power, the transcendent power of this uh, spiritual tradition um, was his first inkling of the transcendent power of aesthetics, right? He was not a religious person in his life, but he very much leaned into the idea that, uh, that formal aesthetics in and of themselves, separate from representation, could actually be transcendent, powerful in that way. He was educated at, at Central. He was a scholarship student at Central High School and then a scholarship student at Penn. He graduated at the age of 20 with an MD from the University of Pennsylvania. He then uh, became involved in the early pharmaceutical industry. He studied in Germany and came back to the United States at the end of the 19th century and uh, began working with a partner to produce their own pharmaceuticals. Uh, they developed their own pharmaceutical that became very popular called Argerol. It was the first topical antiseptic of its time at a, t at a moment when there were no oral antibiotics. So it was used for everything from nose infections to ear infections and eye infections. Significantly, it was very easy to produce. It was very cheap to produce. And in his factory in West Philadelphia, which had an integrated staff right from uh, the outset and also was managed by women, which is very interesting, it was a small staff, um, it was so easy to produce and so lucrative. He was a millionaire by 1905, but in the factory, he had witnessed in Germany uh, factory education programs for workers. And he thought, I, so he compensated his workers for eight hour work days, uh, but only required them to work for six. And two hours every day were set aside for education. Education in a pragmatic tradition. Uh, it wasn't civics, it wasn't economics, it was, he would, read from uh, philosophical and psychological treatises by pragmatic authors like uh, William James and uh, George Santayana and most significantly John Dewey and and they would conduct these very sort of elaborate conversations about the significance of these arguments about how one could be in the world and improve oneself improve one's lot in life by developing ever higher powers of, of self-critical reflection uh, he began bringing art into the factory, and that became part of the education program and developed what was later called the Barnes-Dewey method or objective method that involved extended periods of observing the formal aspects of pictures and discussing them. But it really was, he referred to works of art as instruments. Not, he didn't talk about them as works of art, he talked about them as instruments in an educational process by which one could cultivate one's sense of self self-awareness, self-critical powers, and so forth, and in that way, go back out into the world and improve one's lot in life. So um, John Dewey, who was a very good friend, encouraged him to open the foundation uh, to grow that educational project. It opened in 1925, uh, and he conducted a quite elaborate educational program there until his death in 1951. Um, significantly, and I guess I could segue right into this conversation, uh, he was uh, very involved with uh, various social movements. He was deeply interested in the experience and culture of people of color. Uh, and he was very interested in uh, the pro John Dewey's arguments about democratic inclusion in education and very interested even before the establishment of the foundation in how he could support the education of African-American people. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna do 
a very quick chronology that was prepared by our archivist, Barbara Bokar, former archivist, that tells you about the arc of their relationship, which really, with Dr. Bond and Dr. Barnes, which really only lasted for five years, but I think for both of them was very significant. Um, they met in the fall of 1946. Um, Barnes and Bond met at a funeral for a, a gentleman called Nathan Mosell, who was the first African-American to graduate with a Doctor of Medical Arts degree from Penn and was the founder of the Frederick Douglass Hospital. They both spoke at his as memorial service. He was a Lincoln grad. <laughs> it, it was bound to happen. Um, Barnes then, they met, at this, they met at, this, at this memorial service and Barnes invited Bond to the Barnes Foundation to discuss its educational program and Bond responded with a, a reciprocal invitation for Barnes to speak at Lincoln University. In the winter of 47, Barnes did speak at Lincoln and then he met informally afterward with students at Dr. Bond's home and he actually stayed overnight the ghost of Dr. Barnes. Um, and then he later, he was so impressed with the students he met there that he actually made a $1,000 donation to Lincoln right after that visit and dedicated that money to supporting tuitions and living expenses for students in need. Uh, in the fall of 47, uh, Lincoln professor Walter Fales then invited Dr. Barnes to speak at the university. Barnes was uh, afraid of driving. It was, an, it was a, a scary driver and it was the winter, so he didn't want to travel out there in the winter and drive, so um, he postponed his visit till the spring. In the spring of 48, Barnes again declined this invitation, um, but instead asked permission uh, to take students from Lincoln to the Barnes Foundation for the first time. So Barnes um, suggested that Fales select some Lincoln students to enroll in the classes that were already being conducted at the foundation. And this was in 48, it didn't actually happen for two years, but this was really the beginning of that formal relationship. I promise I'm almost done. Uh, Bond, then, Bond in 1949, after the war, traveled uh, for the first time to Africa, and Barnes was able to return for the first time to Europe after the war. Uh, Dr. Bond returned with the idea of establishing at Lincoln an Institute of African Studies. In the summer of 1950, Bond offered Barnes himself a lectureship to teach a course on African art as part of this new Institute of African Studies. And Barnes countered, in Barnes fashion, he countered with an offer to fund a Dewey, John Dewey, professor at Lincoln, who would teach classes at the Barnes Foundation for Lincoln students. Uh, in the fall of 1950, they hired a gentleman called John Longacre, who was a former Barnes student and a graduate of Columbia University, where John Dewey taught. And Barnes classes for Lincoln students then began in the fall of 1950. Two weeks, just two weeks after the kickoff of this relationship, Barnes and the board of trustees of the foundation, which involved Barnes and his wife and a close, some close uh, friends, uh, got together and changed the indenture, which was his, his trust agreement and agreement to the, uh, excuse me, and the agreement to the bylaws of the Barnes Foundation, uh, eventually transferring governance responsibility for the Barnes to Lincoln. And it is not clear if, if anyone knew this was actually happening on the Lincoln side of the ledger. So try to imagine. Um, in November of that year, Barnes was too ill to attend the, the launch of the African, uh, the Institute for African Studies. In that spring of 51, uh, the Lincoln University Board, to honor Dr. Barnes for all of this, had transpired, offered him an honorary doctorate, which he uh, did not attend the ceremony to receive. But in that academic year, they did for the first time hire dedicated teachers to teach those Lincoln Barnes classes. Uh, they searched, and this is a really important part of the story, Barnes, and we'll talk about why in a minute, but, but they had searched unsuccessfully for almost two years to find a faculty member that was trained uh, in the tradition of John Dewey, in the pragmatic, pragmatic tradition that Barnes would pay to be a faculty member, support at Lincoln, but with the idea that this person would facilitate the relationship and bring students to the foundation. That didn't happen. Uh, in the summer of 19, because no one actually stood up, uh, no, one, no one stepped up to Barnes' uh, expectations. Surprise, surprise. Um, in the summer of 1951, Dr. Barnes was killed in an automobile accident in July. But that September, classes did begin. So that first uh, semester of 51, 52 academic year with three new teachers at the foundation and the students were received at the foundation and taught 
though there was no, uh, no faculty member at Lincoln uh, to support the project. So that was really to kick off the relationship in 1951. That's a lot in just a few years. The, the Methodist thing, I think, is interesting because they had such different, um, such seemingly different backgrounds, but they actually met at a Methodist church, too, right? That's where the funeral was, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, so tell me, you know, from that, from that beginning, um, and Brenda, let me ask you what you think about this. You know, what, what of, their, of, of Dr. Barnes and Dr. Bond's original intents um, do you think is still relevant today? Yeah, so um, I was looking at some letters as well. I didn't have an archivist, so I was my own this week. Um, <clears throat> and what I found interesting was that a lot of the conversation that we've had about the move and the change in the number of trustees was just around control of the trustees and the board. But um, in some of the letters that we have from Dr. Barnes to Dr. Horace Manbon, the real intent was to sort of create this um, this this relationship between the Barnes Foundation and Lincoln University, where you would have this superior education um, offered in his um, approach to learning art, and that you would do it in such a way that it was the um, the 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 most um, exciting, cutting edge you know, best relationship ever, and that he could establish this between the Barnes and this small um, African-American liberal arts institution, and, um, and that it was really about making sure that his approach to education and his value for the, you know, just the power of aesthetics and, and creating intelligence, I think, is what really drove that vision. And so for me, when I think about that, I think that we spent a lot of time over the last couple of decades, you know, worrying about the wrong thing. And that what we really need to focus in on is trying to figure out how to realize um, this sort of powerful educational program um, in, in a way in which Lincoln and the Barnes Foundation can come together to offer this very unique sort of experience. I think what he wanted to do was to put that program in and of itself on, on, a, on a platform or a stage um, that really attracted um, international attention. And I think we still have an opportunity to do that um, in such a way um, that we can really begin to build the arts program at Lincoln. So as I've been looking at a lot of different um, iterations of this. So I went back and I looked at how it was thought about um, from the perspective of Dr. Niera Sadakasa, who was actually um, president of Lincoln at the time that um, the Barnes and all of the transactions were happening. I think it was around then really that the um, controlling number of the trustees passed on. And then looking at it again under Dr. President um, Ivy Nelson, when the sort of court orders and things were going on. And, and in all of those iterations, there is this focus on um, this, this vision for keeping um, going the idea of creating this institution, institute where we would be really educating students at Lincoln using the Barnes method. And sometimes it was on his sort of innovative and, and um, um, really um, pioneer work on African art and the influence of African art on Western and other traditions. Other times it was just the Barnes approach to using aesthetics to actually teach about the humanities. Um, and so how that program was to evolve, I don't think ever really fully got off the ground. But in some of the letters that he wrote to um, President Bond, um, just really close and prior to his death, it was really clear that he was reaching out to John Dewey to try to figure out um, whether or not this experiment, is what he called it, was an experiment, whether or not that experiment would be feasible. And if it would be feasible, how might they all work together to get some other outside agencies connected to financing it? So I think he had in his mind that this would be a really, really big endeavor, that it would cost a lot of money, but I think he thought it would shake up the world 
um, if he were to do it. And I think that seems consistent with his personality because that relationship has a lot of shock value to it. And I, I believe that that was also part of his intent. And so we still have an opportunity to shock the world. I mean, that's my conclusion. Love that. I think shocking the world is great. I, I think Barnes would love that, that framing. Um, you know, was in, in, his, in his relationship with Bond and the proposals that they explored about this partnership, two of Barnes' core commitments came together for the first time. I mean, the, the Barnes is not a museum, right? He was always clear it was an educational foundation. And what he was teaching, yes, about and through the arts, but what he was teaching at a, at a deeper level, right, was this kind of, uh, kind of uh, so approach to uh, cultivated self-awareness as a, as a basic life skill, as a fundamental life skill. But he also, at the same time he was developing the foundation and reaching out to Penn, he reached out to Haverford, he reached out to Swarthmore, he reached out to Paffa, uh, to try to create the relationship that he eventually proposed to and, and Dr. Bond's, uh, Dr. Bond supported. Um, he was also working very hard in a parallel. I mean, th this surprised me when I went back, even before the, the foundation opened, he was involved in conversations and pub the production of publications about um, a kind of Deweyan perspective on Af education for African American people, right? And and how critical and significant it was for a variety of reasons. And so those things actually came together in this idea that the program would be focused on on Lincoln students and supported by Lincoln faculty and so forth. So incredibly important. And then your I think your Many people aren't aware that Barnes was really one of the first people, uh, certainly in the United States, to talk about African material culture as something other than anthropological, right? Mm -hmm. And to speak about it and to value it in the same way people spoke about and valued European modernism, uh, great decorative art, significant historical art from the West, and also, of course, the, the great traditions of the world. And so it's, it's also, and in Barnes' mind, of course, making that work available, particularly for the study by African American artists, authors, and so forth, was a way to uh, encourage a kind of connection and a sense of, of racial pride or race pride at that time. So these things all came together in that relationship with Dr. Bond, which is why he was so enthusiastic about it. And I think, yeah, there's so much to rest out of that story and that set of commitments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, Brenda, when you when you got, I know you you guys said you've been talking pretty consistently for the last five years since you've been at, at Lincoln to really craft what all of this can be. And one of the things that you um, have done at Lincoln is really is really try to to um, put a new a renewed focus on the humanities, right, and 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 the arts and sort of what that can do for people even beyond um, careers and skills. And you you know you talk. Uh, very beautifully about how the arts impacted your learning. So, I, so you know, what I, 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 I'd like to know sort of, you know, how do you see the visual arts and in particular what you could do with the Barnes as being part of that mission to really, um, to push the humanities? Yeah, I, I think that is um, essential that you have I think that it's essential if you are a really strong liberal arts institution that you have strong humanity. So I start from, from that perspective. And, and I'm going to quote Facebook, but it's not really my sources all the time. But I was just looking at Facebook the other day, and there was, um, I'm on a group of, um, you know, women of color in, in, in higher ed or whatever. And it was a post about, um, from someone who was just really talking about the importance of reading fiction, right? and how she had observed over time that children who read fiction were more empathetic, that they, that they seem to um, have a better grasp and, and, and feel for humanity and on and on. So just all the things that um, many people would argue that um, really engaging in imagination will do for human growth, right? And she quoted, um, someone who said that they had sort of redefined the different areas and they defined nonfiction as um, learning through information and fiction as learning through the imagination. And, and I think that that's really true and relevant when you think about arts and sciences, right? And so there's definitely a, a science to the arts and there's definitely an art to the sciences for sure. So it's not that either or, 
But when you really think about how um, visual arts, music, and so if you even look in, in, in Dr. Barnes' life, you know, that those musical experiences probably opened for him imaginations and thoughts. And it was so consistent with Dewey. So when you start sort of putting all of that together, things start to make sense as to how he thought about it. But I think that whole idea of the power of teaching the imagination and how the imagination is really important for helping people to understand not only who they are, but it really helps you to understand how you might use that imagination to solve current problems or future problems. And so when we think about the power of the liberal arts, just um, in particular, we're talking about the ways in which we put different ways of knowing together to, to develop the intellect towards really producing individuals who can um, develop ideas and perspectives and solutions um, to problems in very novel ways, right? And I think that's what this Barnes education was really about. I think it was about training the imagination. And I think what was so interesting in his approach is that he approached it like a scientist though, right? So he was like, you observe, but any well put together experiment has some art to it, right? That if you're really gonna be a good scientist, you have to also, I think, be a good artist because experimentation is about designing. But what he, what I get from his approach to, to teaching about art is that it's an experiment, right? You engage stuff. So when you talk about you're talking about the art as tools, it for me it just it's instrumentation, right? Um, as a behavioral scientist, it's it's like the the um, instruments we use to measure behavior and so on. He saw the art as a way of really touching you know, your, your, your product and, and learning about it and then living with it, observation. And so that's a very scientific approach to it, but it's a real, I think, and hopefully this doesn't sound too crazy, but it's, the, it's a really great integration of arts and sciences in a way that mimics what the liberal arts tries to do. And so I think that by having access to you know, just all the great resources that the Barnes Foundation has from the perspective of educating and training and challenging the imagination, um, we greatly enhance our ability to expose our students to an area of knowledge that has um, just uh, uh, the potential to really push and, um, and challenge their intellectual development overall and whether or not they major in the humanities or the social sciences or the sciences, their education overall will be enhanced because your imagination and your, and your information learning together is really what produces a strong intellectual. So, uh, and I hope that that doesn't sound too way out, but. No, there's so much in there, I don't even know where to start. Um, I mean, uh, you've said, and I think this is true, that great art, great art introduces novel ideas in novel forms, right, in new ways, and that has the power to sort of change the way people think and feel and behave. And then the Dewey and idea that it's about experience and and critical self-reflection, this kind of dialectic, like I have an idea about the world and then I encounter something new like a great work of art or a great work of literature, and it modifies the way I think about the world so then I behave differently and I encounter new things and continually I evolve as an intellect um, and as an emotional being and so forth because of that dialog dialectical engagement with the world's very dewy and idea. But I also think something you alluded to there is really important, and, and that is that I think at base, Barnes was very interested in the idea of empathy. He was very interested in cultivating, using this process of, of a facilitated engagement with great works of art to cultivate empathy. And he, for his, all of his reputation as a kind of rough, uh, you know, difficult guy, and he for sure was in some circumstances a, a challenging guy, right? He was really irascible. Nonetheless, if you look at what he actually did as opposed to what he said, incredibly generous, uh, 
a, a fantastic friend, if you were a great friend of his and so forth. And he clearly himself had a kind of pronounced capacity for empathy. And it was extended in surprising directions for a person of his generation. So I think all of those things in here in his approach to presenting and, and talking about and engaging uh, the public with art. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I have to say though, it's, it's interesting because the, I mean, from like the, from somebody who's not in the world of academia, you know, you, colleges have schools of arts and sciences, right? It's always been that connection between arts and sciences. Um, but these days, that's kind of radical, this idea that you would have education, that, that you would have classes and you would encourage people to just be educated as their whole people without it being because if you take classes at the Barnes, you will be a better engineer, right? Just this idea that it is educating the whole person. And so it's interesting that this idea, which I think for a long time was just something that we um, thought of as being the way education is, is actually come around again to be as um, sort of rebellious as it was when Dr. Barnes was talking about it, which is kind of fascinating. Um, Tom, I'm, um, I'm going to quote you from The Citizen. We did a story on you, um, in which um, you were talking about how part of your mission here from when you started here um, has been to build networks and communities around our experience, which means in part bringing in an audience that is younger, um, that is more racially and economically diverse than the, the what has been the typical museum goer. So, um, which of course is also was also Dr. Barnes's mission. So um, this is a two-part question. How's that going? Um, and how does that pertain to the work with Lincoln in particular? So the, the project of, of developing an audience, that our, it is our goal that we will have not just an occasional audience that mirrors the demographics of Philadelphia, but that actually is a walk-in audience that mirrors the demographics of Philadelphia, which is to say that we know that if we offer certain kinds of programs, we can move the lever around who's attending, it depends what it is, um, certain kinds of educational programs, certain kinds of talks, social events, and so forth. But what we want is the population of Philadelphia or a representative body of that population of Philadelphia to be a walk-in audience, to be members, to be guests, to participate fully in all activities here at the Barnes Foundation. So to make that happen is a symphonic it has to, you have to take a symphonic approach to it. It's everything, um, it, every part of the operation. And I mean, there, there are myriad ways that we've tried to do that. But first, I think the, the most important thing is that to acknowledge that museums historically have been great at telling people what they want and need instead of asking them what they want and need. So I think part, a big part of the project at the outset was to figure out, to ask the people that weren't participating what they wanted needed from the institution that would make them hone more closely to what we were doing. And we did this in a variety of ways. We asked, um, and so I'll just give you a few examples of things that we did at the outset. Um, one of the things we did was, was tweak our exhibition programs. So um, the collection is fixed. It is what it is and presented in the way that it's, it, you know, we, we cannot move it. Um, we've done a great deal to support education around the collection through a variety of, of digital means and so forth, but collection's not gonna move. So our changing exhibition program is one of the, the, the key, uh, you know, uh, public presentations. And early on, and, and Dr. Nancy Irison, who's our, who's our chief curator, uh, who's here tonight, was, was really instrumental in adjusting the program. So when the building opened, the program looked a lot like the European modernist part of the collection. And gradually over time, it has become a changing exhibition program that is one-third European modernism, one-third art of the African diaspora, and one-third art by other underrepresented individuals and groups, right? So, so people can see themselves, a wide variety of people can see themselves in the programs that we do here. Another thing we did was, was Barnes was very, very interested. He referred to uh, working class people as, as, the plain, as plain people, the plain people, and I want to serve the plain people. He thinking of himself as one of the plain people. Uh, and so we really wanted to figure out what neighborhoods we weren't reaching in the city, what we were already doing it through our pre-K through 12 programs, which are focused on schools and underserved neighborhoods. So that was already a big, big hit, but what more could we do? So we actually 
engaged Temple University, an organization called Be Heard Philly, to sort of go into neighborhood zip codes in the city that weren't re well represented in our membership body, our visitors, and to ask, you know, do you know about the barns? Do you know what they do? Have you been there? All these kinds of things. And we were able to take that information, map it onto public transportation routes, develop a series of programs that were focused specifically on branch libraries, parks and rec centers in those neighborhoods we weren't reaching that were under-resourced, underserved, uh, but that were on public transportation lines that connect them to the barns, and build a series of programs in those, those neighborhood outlets to make ourselves visible. One of them was a virtual tour of the barns. Take virtual tour into the library, invite people in, give them a virtual tour with an educator, and then invite them to the barns on a subsequent weekend. Um, and before the pandemic, we had served hundreds of people through these programs. They, about 40% about uptake, people that would do the virtual tour would come to the barns on the subsequent weekend and tour with the same educator and their own cohort. Uh, and then we created a community pass program. So everyone that participates in these and all of our, of our community and social impact programs is offered a community pass, which is a, essentially a family membership for a year, free membership with all that that entails. Um, so make ourselves visible, invite people in, make them feel comfortable, help them figure out how to get over the threshold and get into the building and so forth and so on. That has had an enormous uptake and it was very positive. The pandemic, of course, put a chill on all this stuff. So we're now rebooting these activities. Um, and increasingly, we have thought of ourselves as, um, as a provider of other kinds of services in the community that are not necessarily artistic services that are aligned with uh, you know, various needs in the social services arena and so forth. So what are our core competencies? How do they meet needs of, of, of people we're not serving in the city? And how can we bring them? So restorative justice, um, biliteracy, education, and on and on and on in all of those ways. And all, of course, we invite all those people in with community passes. So we've distributed thousands of these, and we have quite a bit of uptake on that program as well. So make ourselves visible, ask people what they want, try to give them something they want and need, help them get here, help them feel comfortable, and hope that this, this creates a, a lasting relationship. Because you can't do it one time. You can't, it, it, this has to be an ongoing engagement. So just a few things we've tried to do. Yeah, that's great. And and you were you were starting to see um, the results of that, and yes. and now starting over again. Mm -hmm. I get. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what you're actually going to be doing together. So um, you know, what are what are some of the programs that you're going to have Lincoln students do at the barns? So I have to say, um, preparing for this conversation has really changed my focus. <laughs> Um, you know, I came into Lincoln as an alum, um, only knowing what I knew as an alum, right? And then I picked up some programs that we had started since Tom was here, but I don't know, when did you get here? I can't even remember. Okay, well, I know. So, yeah, so I connected with him soon after he got here. And I think we picked up some things that people had started um, and moved those along, but this exercise here has given me an opportunity to really rethink what the intent was. And I now understand that some of the things that we've been doing don't really fit the intent. So yes, it's important that we've done these internships where our students come and they just sort of learn um, museums, right? We know that there is a huge um, dart of, of people of color in just in the museum world largely just defined and I think those internships really help our students to see these, this as a career path. But this week I've just become more and more interested in how we might really capitalize on the educational experience. And so it's not just that our students come and visit the collection, but how do we really maximize you know, this, this sort of relationship such that it becomes an integral part of their education overall. And, and that, you know, studying in the Barnes way was just so impactful for philosophers and, you know, all kinds of people and really thinking about the power and, and, and the role of training the imagination and how art is so central to doing that it seems to me that we should be thinking about 
an educational program, I think, with more depth to it. Um, and I don't know how we do that in this context. I think the things that we've learned about what we can do virtually opens up some possibilities. Um, we talked often about courses, right? And we've always run into problems with resources, right? But you know, we can figure that out now that we really know that we can use the power of technology to fix some of those things. My, my people welcome students a little late because it takes a while to get down here from, um, from up where we are, right? And, you know, that could be a, a barrier, but I think we can figure that out going forward. So I say all that to say that I think that some of the things we've been trying to do together to keep the relationship going have been um, good efforts. But I think if we revisit the incident, and I had just sort of written down what it was that Barnes had told um, Dr. Bond that he was going to Dewey to talk about, but he basically said he intended to speak with him, that is John Dewey, um, about his plans to make the resources of the foundation an integral part of Lincoln's educational program. And he said the goal would be to weld Lincoln and the foundation into an educational enterprise that has no counterpart elsewhere. That's a tall, huge sort of task um, and a dream, right? But I think in the way that Tom and I have been trying to really be earnest about moving this forward, that we can possibly think of ways to, to, to sort of begin to realize that, I think in a more profound and impactful way, um, if we just sort of think about where our two institutions are, what our resources are, what our needs are, and then how do we pull those together to try to realize this particular dream. So that's where I am this week. So, Tom, I mean, what, what do you, um, you know, I'm curious about how, how the Barnes Foundation views the benefits of this relationship, right? Like, I understand that, that Lincoln students have this incredible opportunity to learn. What is it that the Barnes is, is getting out of this relationship? Well, the Barnes derives an enormous benefit from this relationship, right? First of all, uh, Lincoln is Lincoln is our priority educational partnership um, for in the academic setting, and it, it is the priority for us. And because it's a priority, and because through time this relationship has taken different forms um, and continues to evolve, and as Brenda suggests, um, it has kept the issues that are important for Lincoln students and faculty top of mind for us. Right, and that is very much. I mean, they were top of mind for Dr. Barnes, you know, a century ago, and so that that relationship has kept them top of mind. That's the first thing. The second thing I think is that that particularly through the internship program, so Lincoln students have have priority in our internship program, which is you know not just about art history, it's not just about curatorial, it's not just about education, it's about the business of culture. It's about all of these things that one can learn working in a nonprofit environment. But having the students here, right, they're young. They look very different than some of the, the people that work here on the staff, right, like most museums. And they bring an ideas and a critical perspective and an energy and an enthusiasm um, that really infuses the entire institution. So every summer when I do my we all do. All of the senior staff have a do a do a sort of talk with their a conversation with the um, the interns. You know, it's the questions they ask, the ideas they offer, the critiques they share. Because you know, people of this age are, feel very comfortable, right? Speaking truth to power, yes. um, <laughs> which is you know sometimes off putting, but you know, but ultimately very yeah. productive. Um, you know, is incredible. So they bring ideas and a perspective and keep it again, uh, you know, they keep us yeah. on our toes. I also think that, I think ultimately we think about the barns, you know, it's a certain scale operation and so forth. We think about how do we grow our impact without growing our resources. And I think one of the ways we yeah. grow our impact um, is by modeling practices that we can share with other institutions, uh, museums, other educational institutions. And I think if we can forge the right kind of partnership, 
you know, long last, because we've talked a lot about how to do yeah. this. If we can do it, I also think we can have an impact uh, on the field, on both of our fields, by modeling a practice, a truly progressive uh, practice in relationship. And, you know, TBD, as Brenda points out, we've talked about it a lot. We've tried a few things. Yeah. We have plenty more things to try. Um, but I think that could have an enormous impact on both of our fields. It's, it, the integration is interesting that it, it is um, something that is always in the foreground mm -hmm. is is a really interesting aspect that I think is is um, not always the case. I mean, it's become something that now we are, that institutions are playing catch up, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I want to I wanna go there for a second. And you mentioned that the idea of, of sort of, uh, of what the internships can do. Um, so, you know, and sort of this, the, the moment that we're in in this sort of great project of equity and justice in America, um, one of the changes that has to be made is more representation and power and, um, you know, decision making, culture creating, and sort of every aspect of our society. Um, and that includes spaces that are, that have traditionally and sort of overwhelmingly been very white and very privileged. and. Um, like museums, and that is um, sort of largely unchanged since Dr. Barnes's day. So, um, you know, like if you if you're sort of envisioning, let's say, 20 years from now, a generation from now, um, you know, how do you? And you touched on this, I think, with this idea of being a model, right? Like, how how can this relationship sort of uh, push forward that that mission of of really having different people being um, the arbiters of, of culture and um, in America, in the world. Well, you know, Dr. Barnes um, was teaching about art in a factory, right? And, you know, so I, th I think the things you said about going to the branch libraries and stuff like that, bringing art um, to communities in, in all forms is a, just a way to expose people um, to not only the beauty of art, but I think the educational purpose of art and its ability to, I think, train and challenge the imagination um, has to be central in what we do. So for a place like Lincoln, you know, we might think of the art as only for art majors or um, sometimes we think of it as only for the art history course that everyone has to take. Um, in order to sort of um, satisfy our general education requirement. If we really think about um, how Barnes, how Dewey, and I, I would believe how Dr. Bond thought about the power of this educational program, what we would be trying to do in 20 years is um, really pique the imagination of more and more of our students who can then go out into the world and pique their imagination of more and more people in the communities where they come from. And I think because art has always, for many communities, seemed like something that only privileged and entitled people do, um, and, and, and that changes a little bit in the black community when you start to introduce black art, right? And this collection, you know, is one of the first collections to ever have African art in it. Um, becomes really very significant, so it becomes the way to, to really pique the interest. I always tell people, my favorite room is the room with the Picasso and the African sculptures side by side because it, it speaks volumes about, um, not even what the pieces are, but that he had the audacity to place those things side by side um, really piqued my interest and made me want to think more about well, what was he thinking, you know, when he did that. And I think that's exactly the the feeling he wanted to invoke in people. And so I think if we're able to use the power of that for the students that we serve at Lincoln, you know, we're, tr we're training or we're at least introducing to a um, cohorts of people the importance of art. And what do we do with the liberal arts education? We take it out and we put it in the service of other people in our communities. And in that way, you begin to just sort of break down the barriers about who art is for. And I think if we taught people about the power of art in the right way, we can begin to understand how we can also use that in the communities where we have done so much to dampen imagination that we sort of see some of the other progress go away with that. Yeah. And I think it could be a way to really 
I think sort of validate communities and also a way to validate the art that they create as being um, something worthy of thinking and imagining about as well. Tom, you, you mentioned when we were talking, in, um, and I think this speaks to this a little bit, that um, you know, we talk a lot about differences, and, and Dr. Barnes um, really talked a lot about what we have in common as, as humans, and his collection reflects that, right? The way the collection is, is hung and displayed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, Brenda put her finger on it, right? This is, Barnes wanted it not to be exceptional that African art, African material culture was juxtaposed with and therefore presented to the public as as significant, as powerful, as valuable as European modernist painting, for example. He didn't want it to be exceptional. And I and I would because he didn't think it was, it should be exceptional. And I, I would say the same thing about you were talking about the field. You know, I mean it shouldn't be exceptional that a museum staff, that every museum staff of any kind of museum look exactly like the real world, which is to say fully diverse. Right. Um, and, and so our role in that, I think, is, is to figure out all the different ways that we can, as an institution, be a pipeline yeah. for African-American students, undergraduate, faculty members, um, to find their ways into these institutions. And those pipelines really don't exist. They still don't exist after all this time. So how do we become that pipeline um, for students from Lincoln, first and foremost? Right, so then, you know, the Barnes can be a, a, a launch pad to institutions all over the, mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful vision. Um, so we only have a couple minutes, but I, I, um, I wanted to, um, you, you mentioned, I think, you, you touched on the question I had, which is I'd love to hear a little bit about the art in, what here in the museum particularly is meaningful to you as a piece of art or as a room? Told you my favorite room is the Picasso. <laughs> but tell me, can you tell me why? Like why is that the room Picasso there? with the African sculptures? And so um, I was fortunate um, when I, I did my postdoc at Yale University and took some classes with Robert Ferris Thompson and with Sylvia Boone, who um, they were they were great um, they were great art historians and they studied Africa. So when I go in that room and I see the pieces that Dr. Barnes assembled, it just sort of reminds me of the, the classes I had there. But when I then glance up at the wall and I see a Picasso there, um, every time I've been taught African art or every time I've been taught art, it's usually in a space where it's either Impressionist or European or African or African American. Yeah. And then you walk in a room like that, and it's all there. And it, it really sort of jars you mm -hmm. um, to begin to think about, hmm, how do these things go together? So again, I think it piques the imagination. It makes you um, want to spend time in there and, and, and look at the objects themselves. You start to see some of the similarities. At least for me, I start to see some of the similarities. And I wonder, where in Africa did Picasso go? Because a lot of this stuff looks like it has some West African influence to it, right? And, and I think that that's what art is supposed to do. Um, but more than just the pieces, um, the way the pieces are put together in this museum um, in and of themselves um, pique the imagination. And, and for me, that room in particular, because I had never seen those um, types of art presented together. And my first time seeing it, it really threw me off. And so every time I come, I, I go there again because I see something different every time yeah. um, I, I actually enter that room. Tom, you spent a lot of time here, so. Well, I, I'm just, the, the, there's something remarkable about Brenda's attachment to this wall, henceforth known as Dr. Allen's wall. But you know, the, the African, African art material culture appears in yeah. more than one gallery. But that's the only place where in the I would argue in the entire Barnes Foundation, where Dr. Barnes makes an explicit case for influence. Mm -hmm. And why does he do that? He wants people who understand and value European modernism.
to recognize that the source of the innovation of that European modernism is African sculpture. I wasn't too far off. I'm no, no, it was, that was good. You're an intuitive. <laughs> it was very, I mean, and so that's, I think that's a, I think it's a really, really yeah. powerful thing. That is a remarkable wall for that reason. And, and he believed that by making that work available and making that sculpture available in that context, he was training, you know, artists, he was training writers, and he was training the public at large yeah. to value, embrace, and try to understand African material culture and what it represents. That's lovely. Um, that seems like a good place to end, unless you have anything you want to add. Stay tuned. Right. A lot of work to do, but we're partners, so we'll be good. Great. Thank you. Thank all of you.